Welcome to Zavi's Video Rewind, a podcast from Zavi, the home of pop culture. I'm your host, Emily Murray, and together we'll be digging into our video archives, discussing a wide range of cult classics, all of which have recently received, or will be receiving, a new release on disc. Each week I'll be joined by a guest to discuss a movie and the importance of film restoration. And for this episode, we'll be diving into none other than the 1993 romantic crime drama, True Romance directed by Tony Scott and written by Quentin Tarantino. The story follows an ex-call girl and her husband as they go on a run from the mafia after stealing a shipment of drugs from her former pimp. It stars a great ensemble cast which includes Christian Slater, Patricia Arquette, Gary Oldman, James Gandolfini, Brad Pitt, Christopher Walken and so many more brilliant actors. The film recently received a new release from our friends at Arrow Video which includes a new 4K release, Blu-ray and Zavi exclusive 4K deluxe steelbook all of which feature newly commissioned artwork and both a director's cut and a theatrical cut of the movie. I think what you did was so romantic. I just, I want you to know that you can count on me to protect you. We are joined by a guest you would definitely say you're so cool to, as film journalist Cameron Frew joins me to discuss this cult favourite. How's it going, Cameron? I thought you might like your introduction. <laughs> I, I did, but obviously. <laughs> yep, I'm smiling with that intro. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I'm very excited to talk about True Romance. Yeah, uh, you have been begging me to watch True Romance, I think, for a long time. <laughs> I have. You I have. have, so I consider this only fair that I'm on here to discuss this. <laughs> yeah, um because i hadn't seen it before until this new release and i thought it'd be a good one for the podcast because obviously the podcast is all about cult classics getting new releases I, it actually surprised me that i hadn't seen it because i would say i'm quite a big tarantino fan i love tarantino i love his style i love his screenplays i don't know if like some part some part of my brain was like oh he didn't direct this i don't you know i won't touch that but that i was wrong basically <laughs> Well, I mean, wrong. Po- the podcast can just end because that's all we see. Yeah, you were wrong. <laughs> like... Yeah, because I uh, I watched it for the first time. I watched a new Arrow release, which is gorgeous. And uh, I should say that we're talking about the theatrical cut because there's two different cuts. I will go back and watch the director's cut, but we watched a theatrical cut for the podcast. And um, I didn't really know what to expect because I didn't know too much about it. I was like, true romance. I was like well it sounds romantic but it's Tarantino it's gonna be a bit you know edgy pulpy violent which obviously it is but I think what struck me about it was just how kind of cute (laughs) it is it's just sweet it's just nice yeah I like I like it's very it's very very romantic yeah yeah and yeah I think that's I think that's why it works to be honest it's like you just said at the beginning um you were initially maybe a little bit put off by the fact that Quentin Tarantino didn't direct it. Um, but all of the sweetness of it is Tony Scott. Like, yeah. he... The man, the man was a master, and um, no one really made movies like Tony Scott. <laughs> and True Romance is a perfect illustration of that. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose my first question for you is, because I know this is like one of your favourite films, so I wanted to know what your first impression was of it when you first saw it, if you remember when you first watched it, because I said this was my first time and I was delighted with it, to be honest. Yeah, I remember exactly when I first watched True Romance. It was back in 2015. I was working at CEX at the time and during my regular shifts of stacking DVDs, I would always see True Romance uh, in the the T section of the the DVD section, <laughs> and I I was just always curious about it. Like I was vaguely aware of it. I knew that Tarantino had, had written it, um, 
I, I don't want to pretend to say I knew that Tony Scott had directed it because I wasn't quite as into films back then, even as much as I am now, uh, to a different extent. Uh, and just I just took the plunge one day. It was like 50p on DVD. I was like, you know, I'm just going to buy this. I'm just going to see what yeah. it's like. And uh, instantly, one of my favourite movies. Um, uh, my my favourite Tarantino movie, to be honest. Um, if we're including movies that he's just yeah. written and hasn't <laughs> hasn't directed uh i would i would take true romance over any movie he's directed it's my it's one of my favorite movies it had a huge impact on me it's it's a movie that i've tried endeavored to get so many people to watch including yourself because <laughs> anyone anyone who watches it i haven't i've yet to find anyone who doesn't really love true romance um or at the very least enjoys it uh i I, I know there will be reasons why some people may take against it, but it's it, that's one of the reasons it's a cult classic. It's not it's mm. not glossy. It's 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 inappropriate and violent, and uh, the dialogue is proper old style Tarantino without maybe quite as much nuance as it as there is now in some of his dialogue, like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, yeah. and all of those are just it's it's great for that reason. It's it's a right. E- like what's the word relic of of the early 90s yeah yeah because one of the things i was gonna ask you as well is because i looked at sort of how well did the box office because i think i found for a lot of films we're talking about on the podcast i think last action hero is the best example of a, you know it did, like act like last action hero this film flopped at the box office it didn't make any money i think it earned 12 million against a budget of 12.5 million so it did make a loss like not much of a loss but it still made a loss um which is puzzling to me because watching it in like today's world i'm like that's a great movie it's as you say i can't really see why anyone wouldn't enjoy it like yeah. it's got all the elements it's fun it's cute it's got a bit of comic book violence it's romantic it's just it's just a, a wonderful film to watch so i'm puzzled why nobody went to see well obviously people to go to see it but why it didn't do very well at the box office because i think also it was released after reservoir dogs so Reservoir Dogs was a bit of a hit, and then this came mm-hmm. out, and it's Tony Scott, Tarantino, the cast is amazing, like, why did it not perform? So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. You know, it's one of those things, I think I can only chalk it up to people being the worst and <laughs> something really inexplicable. Like, the Shawshank Redemption tanked at the box office. I did not know that. Uh, and, on, but... and, only, and only became a success on, on VHS and later DVD releases. Um, and this is just a very similar story. True Romance, clearly at the time, in theatres didn't really capture people's uh, attention um, for reasons I, I, I don't know how I would be able to explain, but def- it's definitely lived on as Arrow Video's release clearly yeah. shows people are interested in owning it at home. And the fact that it's got such a, a bespoke release uh, just like completely speaks to it being a cult classic. Mm. And that regard it's a shame that it didn't do well theatrically but in a weird way i'm kind of glad that it didn't because it's got this sort of allure to it that yeah. anything when i first watched it and mentioned it to people that i was going to watch it you got like the the wide eye reaction of someone who knows they're about to see a really good movie for the first time uh yeah. and yeah I, I like i like the fact that it has that status obviously not great for the studio that it didn't make <laughs> enough money on it but um i mean uh, everyone for, did for, everyone yeah. did well like it, it's not like it ended Tarantino's career or Scott's career or anyone's career. They all went yeah. to do other stuff. So, but yeah, I suppose you're right. It sort of gives it like a hidden gem kind of status. It's like I imagine there's a lot of people like me who would say they're Tarantino fans and love Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs, Once Upon a Time Hollywood, like all the big Tarantino movies, but probably haven't seen True Romance. And probably yeah, Tony no, Scott. No, you're fans absolutely as well. right. Yeah. Um, no, I, I would absolutely Tarantino. agree with that. Uh, I showed my flatmate. Uh, True Romance last year he'd never seen it uh, and he'd never really heard of it despite saying he would be a Tarantino fan and that's been the case with most if not all uh, people I've shown True Romance to over uh, the past six yeah. years yeah but as you said earlier the sort of trick about True Romance is obviously it's very Tarantino but it's the way that Tony Scott sort of softens the edges like as you said all the romantic all the softness all the sort of ma- there's like a sort of magical I think sort of aspect to true romance with as opposed to instant romance and this weird journey and the fact that you both survived this like crazy journey as well mm-hmm. and obviously you got elvis <laughs> in, in the bathrooms with um with clarence so there's a sort of magical 
cutesy softness to it and that's all Tony Scott edging out Tarantino's kind of cynicism um so I think that's sort of really what makes this film special is as he, what you said earlier is the way that Tony Scott sort of brings to life this story in a kind of different way to a scene of a Tarantino story has been brought to life on screen yeah uh, it's, it's 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 exactly that um I think I'd say especially because it's an early Tarantino work I, I think Once Upon a Time in Hollywood shows that he, he is capable of being a bit sweeter with yeah. his stuff but true romance is a different level of of cute saying I don't I, I don't mean that in a bad way like that's why the movie works that it's so overtly overly schmaltzy at times as part of its as part of it a huge part of its charm um Alabama and Clarence falling in love instantly I remember the first time I watched it thinking <laughs> like <laughs> there's there, there's just no way but it's it is just meant to be a complete pulp fantasy in in that regard and yeah elvis played by val kilmer is just uh, yeah. bizarre uh, but yo i always remember elvis from true romance and it's emotional as well like that that it lends itself to that hugely like the ending of true romance for me make make makes my eyes well up um and i'm pretty sure my, my girlfriend lily even shed a couple of tears at the end of True Romance first time she watched it because you just get swept up in it it feels like a like a classic Hollywood ending but mm. with with blood and <laughs> and death and cocaine and, and all that stuff thrown in yeah it's a it's a Tarantino Scott ending but it's interesting you bring up the ending because obviously that wasn't Tarantino's original ending he wanted Clarence to die in the final shootout and then sort of Alabama would just be I suppose left by herself so um, horrendous that would be horrendous <laughs> um, so it's interesting that that's how Tarantino wrote it so it's a perfect example of what we said about how Tarantino was like right yeah Clarence is gonna die because that's kind of realistic like I'm surprised Clarence lasted that long to be honest um, but as you said it's because it is a romantic fantasy from the early 90s it's so pulpy and magical like it makes sense for the way that the story has been told that they have to live together on a beach with a child uh, and it is very it's kind of like not sickening but like what's the word like sickly sweet but in yeah. a good way um, yeah yeah it never it never overindulges like it's it, it, it's very sure of itself and i never i've never felt put off by how sweet it is it's nice to have candy like and that's what that's ultimately what it is um but like i said with all this horrible stuff thrown into it which is why it's like such a good 18 rated yeah uh movie uh it, it felt like i'm glad i watched it at the age i did because I, I as i've spoken to you before i've watched lots of films when i was younger that i was ultimately too young to see that <laughs> i've appreciated because of that reason i don't think i would have got as much out of this when i was really young compared to when i was well, in 2014 i was 17 2015 i was mm. 17 18 and it was just perfect it's a perfect perfect movie i still think it's a bit of a perfect movie for me personally but yeah yeah it is interesting though how I suppose this sort of yeah how Tony Scott does sort of bring these edges to this story because it is very Tarantino at times like I always think that uh, you can tell when it's more Tarantino than Scott for example the Sicilian scene with Christopher Walken um, that's when Tarantino has a sort of little moment to shine I suppose because it does I think that helps it stop from being too sweet as well because you do have this sweet romance but then there's sort of these weird violent aspects and sort of where the dialogue really gets a bit cut in i like the sicilian scene i'd heard i'd heard about that scene before because i think that's one of the standouts and i was like i get why i've heard of this before it's the best scene in the movie it's just it's it's it, and you know what it's a shame to say it's the best scene in the movie cause i don't mean to take away from all the the praise we've just heaped on tony scott for making it his own but that's just my favorite tarantino dialogue it's it's outrageous and yeah and really dramatic um like uh christopher walkins vincent cocotti saying he's the antichrist like uh, i I can't i don't i can't imagine how anyone writes that and that's what the best dialogue should be in tarantino's case dialogue i'm just like how did you come up with that like who writes that in a day you know yeah um yeah yeah it's how i I feel with the uh with a tipping scene in Reservoir Dogs. Reservoir Dogs is my favourite Tarantino. And it's just like, I don't understand how someone could write like such dialogue because it just works so beautifully. Um, yeah. And it is, 
even though we said like obviously it's Tony Scott's film like it is very Tarantino in terms of all the sort of quips pop culture references obviously he's all about the references the quirky tone the big shootout at the end which feels very Tarantino all these like guns everywhere like I think like three different groups come in for the shootout it's all these tropes that we associate with Tarantino but it's just a bit softer and I think that's maybe what makes it a bit more massive appeal because I know that even I love Tarantino I know that Tarantino isn't everyone's cup of tea yeah no no yeah that's the thing some of Tarantino like Reservoir Dogs is a great example considering they came out in such close proximity of one another mm. uh, Reservoir Dogs is, is a brutal film uh, even now yeah. <laughs> uh, whilst it's got f- darkly funny moments um, and some of it has a lighter energy uh, to with with the music and stuff like that, it's uh, true romance. I would sooner show to to someone the Reservoir Dogs just because I I think it's just got a better chance of someone <laughs> really enjoying it because it is distinctly lighter and and, and sweeter and all, all the things we've basically said. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's interesting because I think I read online that uh, Tarantino obviously had these scripts. He had Reservoir Dogs and True Romance, and he pitched both to Tony Scott and he could only pick one um, yep. and Tony Scott picked True Romance and it's like sometimes I'm like what if in a different world it would have been the other way around yeah I'm I'm, actually, I'm so glad that I, <laughs> I can't I just can't imagine a Tony Scott Reservoir Dogs um, but I suppose you can't because you just can't imagine it's, that but yeah. uh, True Romance just feels so more in, in Tony Scott's wheelhouse with, with later work that he did Um like Man on Fire and and Domino and stuff like that, um, and even Deja Vu. Uh, mm. I think True Romance is very much more for Tony Scott, and I'm j- I feel very blessed that he took that script <laughs> yeah. instead of the other one. I mean, he wanted both, but Tarantino was like, "Nah, you can have one. No. You can have one of my uh my presents." I suppose uh, Tarantino used the money that he made from selling True Romance to make Reservoir Dogs. So I suppose we have Tony Scott to thank for Reservoir exactly. Dogs as well. True Romance is the root of Tarantino's success for me. As much as Reservoir Dogs was his immediate launch pad, critically, uh, you don't have Reservoir Dogs without True Romance, so True Romance is responsible for it all. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting, something you said earlier about when you first watched it and you saw the romance and how they instantly fall in love, you were a bit like, because ah. I was at first a bit like, well, this doesn't feel real. But it's interesting how I had that, my, that thought for like, two seconds in my mind and then you find yourself easily swept up in their love story I think you're right I think as soon as you realise this is a fantasy obviously it's not a fantasy on the screen but it's like a it's a fantasy sort of tell um, you're like right I'll just go with it and I think a lot of it has to do with the chemistry between Patricia Urquette and Christian Slater who are excellent um, there's mm-hmm. a moment where Christian Slater is like he seems all sweet and nice and shy and he goes into the bathroom and he talks to Elvis about wanting to kill the pimp. I was like, oh, you're just a bit unhinged, mate. Like, <laughs> but I yeah. buy it. <laughs> yeah. I think it only took me literally like seconds to believe their relationship after uh, Alabama <coughs> uh, says she's she's in love with yeah. Clarence. Like, as they're walking down the steps after getting married, I was just like, okay, I'm with it. I'm with it now but like you say there are those moments where he talks to Elvis and I'm like this guy is a lunatic like he is he is fully crazy and then obviously goes to 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 Drexel's said yeah. pimp yeah the cast is amazing I think I um, I wasn't really aware of who's in it I knew Christian Slater was in it because I uh, watched Heathers for the first time this year as well which is another great movie so I was mm-hmm. kind of like aware of him and uh, but I didn't know obviously like Val Kilmer Gary Oldman Gary Oldman just shows up. I'm like, that's not Gary Oldman. Wait, is that Gary Oldman? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think again, that's that's something else that and anyone that I've showed it to is always like, is that Gary Oldman? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, the cat, the cast is off the chain, and in, in true romance, even like tiniest, tiniest roles like Brad Pitt, yeah, uh, as the stoner on the couch. James Gandolfini, uh, a young James Gandolfini, Before Samuel L. Jackson, and a tiny, tiny appearance. Yeah. Um, clearly, is beginning Samuel, uh, Samuel Jackson is credited as Big Don, and that's like a that's a great character name. If I yeah. was in a film, I'd want to be Big Don. <laughs> and Chris Penn and Tom Sizemore as the as the cops 
Dennis Hopper, uh, uh, Christopher Walken, and Michael Rappaport, who makes a brief mm. appearance in Friends, but yes, as um, Phoebe's boyfriend, her police boyfriend, as Phoebe's police boyfriend, and and more. Like it's just r- ridiculous. Anytime I watch it, I'm just like, oh, there's that guy. Yeah. Oh, there's that guy. Um, yeah, it's it's amazing. It's just amazing. I think it's because they made Razzle Dogs when everyone's like, ah, oh, we all want to be in in this movie. And it is such a good script. Like, everyone's having fun. But it's not one of those films where it seems everyone's having fun and the more fun they have, the less fun I'm having. I'm having as much fun as they are having on screen. It's like, I read that Gary Oldman loved it so much and he was like, right, I'm bringing my mum to set. His, like, 70-year-old mum was a spare watching him die <laughs> while he's in these, like, mad dreadlocks. Because it's just like, yeah, it's just you get the you kind of get the idea. It's kind of lighthearted and just like everyone's just having a bit of a laugh on set. Um, Jane's kind of feeling for me because I'm currently obsessed with The Sopranos. It was really nice seeing a young him, obviously before he's like Tony Soprano, and he has quite the scene as well with Patricia. He is Quet. terrifying. He is terrifying in True Romance. The the whole speech about how he just kills people now to see the how the 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 expression on their faces change. It's horrible, uh, but you yeah. like. But then you have the scene with him and Brad Pitt, which is just a perfect illustration of everything we've already been saying about how the movie's still light and funny. Um, the the face off between the door. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I like. I just. It's it's a mix of tones in this movie that I I can't really think off the top of my head that have been replicated quite the same. Uh, and the cast, as as you say, the cast clearly of relish every moment of it. Yeah, like Brad Pitt, you can just tell. I think he improvised most of his lines anyways. It gave me very much Brad Pitt. <laughs> Brad Pitt and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood vibes. Because um, obviously that's one of the you films. You condescend that... me, man. <laughs> you, that's I'll one kill of... you, man. Exactly. He's just having a laugh, like, clearly. Um, but as you say, it, it's such a strange mix of tones because what other film will you have where it's got this massive, violent comic book shootout and it cuts to this sort of very dreamy scene on the beach at the end with this family like it just it jumps but it never feels like it's clashing at all no it's a bit it's, it's, it, it, yeah it never loses that balance for me not not at one moment in the movie it's I mean it's it's hard I mean that's the thing it's easy to say oh it's oh, I'm just being biased that's what talking about the movie is and I think <laughs> this movie's flawless uh, there's I, I, I could watch this movie on repeat mm. if, if I wanted to uh, and that's for for all of the reasons we've just said and more, uh, such as as I'm sure you will reference the music. The music yes. is a huge thing for me in this in this movie. Yeah, the music was weird because like the theme comes in, and I knew the theme. I hadn't seen the film, and I knew the theme. So the theme must have been used in like other things, and I know it from there. But it's got a sort of weird. Obviously, it's, we should say it's Hans Zimmer. I mean, I'm sure everyone mm-hmm. knows it's Hans Zimmer because he's a legend but it's sort of got this, it's very different for Zimmer it's very like plinky plonky simplified but it works it's kind of like hypnotic in a way like how simple it is it sort of just gets in your mind but again it sort of goes with the sort of these characters are quite understated and stripped back as a kind of tone for the film as well so it sort of works for this cute simple romance yeah, and it's it's dreamy as well. Like I think it always l- it lends itself well to the sort of fairy tale, uh, pulp fairy tale feeling of the whole movie. The the theme itself, um, I think probably directly, if because people have always said about it, and I'm sure Hans took direct inspiration from Badlands by Terrence yeah. Malick. The theme from that is the xylophone theme from that goes back to Badlands, and then beyond the score itself, just the songs that are used in it. It opens on on Charlie Sexton's Graceland, the song when they're about to go for some pie at the diner. It's John Waits in Dreams. Mm. Uh, like all, all of those, it's like tiny moments, tiny, tiny bursts of music throughout it coupled with the score. Yet when the movie ends, I'm always going hunting out the playlist on, on Spotify to re-listen. And yeah. I, I don't own the score on vinyl yet, which is mm-hmm. criminal considering the vinyls I own already. So that's <laughs> going to be my next purchase, I yeah. think, once the once the box set arrives. Yeah, a nice company in peace. But you're right with the soundtrack. It's not like massive needle drops because sometimes the needle drops, it can mm. be a bit too much. It's subtle. But again, that's what we've sort of been saying throughout this whole podcast about how sort of 
subtle and understated this movie is. Like, I think it just works. And I think the, cho- the song choices, as well as Hans Zimmer's score, it just, it just sort of plays, like, smoothly over the top. Yeah, there's no, there's no big needle drop like uh, Kill Bill's Battle Without Honour or Humanity. There's nothing like in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Bring Out yeah. a Living when Brad Pitt's driving along um, the freeway. That sort of musical usage is not not implemented in True Romance. It far more relies on that recurring motive from, from Hans Zimmer. And that again, that's just why it works. It's just, it sustains this constant magic throughout the movie using that using that score and I think if the needle drops had been made any more explicit or mm. like ju- jukeboxy it, it would have it would take you out of the movie I suppose yeah it takes and you out I'm of that quite, world and that, that yeah that world and that sort of fantasy that they have created you sort of yeah you need to to believe the love and believe the story you have to really absorb yourself into it and everything from mm-hmm the score we haven't even speak about, spoken about the visuals yet and it's sort of sort of glossy washed out sort of mm-hmm. LA like it just looks stunning as well and it's all part of creating this atmosphere to totally absorb you into this fantasy world yeah it, it, for, and, and everywhere it goes it does that like, it opens on a fairly kind of bleak uh, winter Detroit or well a snowy looking Detroit um, with that same theme yeah. Um, it moves into a relatively grotty trailer and that's when it just cuts away uh, most of the music uh, when you go to sunny LA it's like exactly like you said the washed out um, look of LA I think it's a lot of people have said it really represents Los Angeles very well mm. I mean as someone who's never been yeah I, I mean I've never been uh, what people say <laughs> um, but true romance is that something I, I think about when I think of when I think of Los Angeles um, that and uh, I don't know Grand Theft Auto and other movies but True <laughs> Romance True Romance makes me want to go to LA mm. uh, despite again all the horrible stuff that happened to True Romance while, while they're there the the shootouts and and uh, all the drugs all the drugs <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's like yeah I want to like go and those like, one of my favourite scenes is when they go to have the conversation on the roller coaster, <laughs> which is yeah yeah which is ridiculous <laughs> but that's just to- Tony Scott going into pure Top Gun mode when he's filming that's because it's it's just filmed like you would film a sequ- an aerial sequence in Top Gun and the fact that he does that in this movie is another reason why it's just so clearly a Tony Scott movie more than a more than a Tarantino one, um, because you have that you have the you have the wild, bloody shootouts, uh, and the really quick cuts. Which mm. uh, if you've seen when when you see Man on Fire, the, it's just, you can see where the links between the the ways in the film are, and then you have the sweeter stuff as well. Yeah, but it's just like you just have these sort of use of locations like the motel as well, which are just excellent as as you say sort of LA the use of colour the use of colour throughout like I love the neon lit signs of the bar and then also in this sort of video store it, it feels it's what you said earlier like it's a relic of the early 90s it feels so early 90s the like electric blue cinematography in the steamy sex scenes it's just it's so much of that era. <laughs> yes yes the sex scene is uh, another testament to Christian Slater <laughs> and Patricia Arquette's <coughs> chemistry who were so- reportedly dating during the time of the movie. Oh, that's interesting. And I didn't I th- know. And I think the sex scene illustrates that, <laughs> or at least uh, indicates that somewhat, because that, that is a steamy, steamy sex scene. And again, the top it's a Top Gun lighting it from is. when Tom Cruise and Kelly McGillis um, get it on. So uh, another, another Tony Scott trademark. It's just like... It's just so it's so glossy. It's so early nineties, so of his era, and also, it just, but it just works for this film because, as we said, it's a it's got this fantastical magical element. Just, I I, I believe it, and you have to have like all early nineties films need a, a weird sort of steamy sex scene like that. It's 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 a yes. tick box. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I didn't watch this for the first time with my mum and dad. <laughs> Maybe this is why my dad didn't show it to me. Um, I, I did have a question for you, actually, because uh, one of the things I found interesting about it was when looking at what Tony Scott changed from Tarantino's script, obviously we have spoke about the ending, but also the structure mm-hmm. in general. Um, Tarantino's story was originally non-linear, so it like, started at the bar, 
and then went to them being on the run with flashbacks to sort of how they met etc and scott was like nah let's make it straightforward and linear and i'm like why this why did tarantino write it in that way because for me that over complicates it and adds in a mystery there that you don't need it works so much better the to me a- as linear the man's obsessed with non-linear narratives like he was just about to do Pulp Fiction so it doesn't surprise me to hear that they originally envisioned one of his first scripts yeah. as a non-linear narrative and that's probably where I suppose Pulp Fiction might come from his desire to, to do that with True Romance and, and Reservoir Dogs um, but no, uh, True Romance in my opinion would just not work that way I think it operates so much more smoothly as an A to B uh, love story with lots of chaos in between I wouldn't like to, to jump to if, like if this started at the end or like, I, I suppose a non-linear version of True Romance ends, starts with them in the car as they're driving away with Clarence's eye blown to bits yeah. um, and then it would like cut back, no it's wrong it's just wrong, I, 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 would, I would hate that if that if it was non, non-linear yeah, I think the thing with um, it being a linear is it allows you to have that journey of them meeting that spark and them falling in love and if you don't have that journey I don't think it'd work because you sort of be thrown into the chaos and it'd be a bit like trying to find your feet you don't need a mystery of what's going on here at all yeah I don't need any indi- yeah I don't need any indication of where it's going the reason the movie works so well and the first time you watch it is because every five minutes is like whiplash with 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 things that developments that happen whether it's them getting together almost instantly yeah. or Clarence killing a pimp <laughs> uh, if if the movie tracked back to those moments for a non-linear narrative it just wouldn't have the same punch at all yeah yeah it goes from zero to a hundred very quickly but like then it goes back to zero and it goes straight up to hundred yeah. again it's just yeah but as you say like we sort of said earlier with a tone it never it never clashes at all it's kind of remarkable that it works you know <laughs> the more I think yeah. about it but it um, it does work it does work uh, what's your favourite scene then because there's a lot of good ones you know it, it a, it's a really hard thing because there's ones that just kind of jump out to me instantly mm. like like for example I love any scene with uh, Saul Rubinek's movie producer who did uh, Coming Home in a Body Bag and oh, the yeah, war movie yeah. in the movie who is designed as a portrayal of Joel Silver like the, all his scenes are so funny um, but they aren't what I would probably rewatch. It it probably is the Sicilian um, and well actually the whole start of that as, so, as soon as Dennis Hopper's character comes back into his trailer and uh, Christopher Walken's Vincent Cuccotti, uh starts speaking to him that's what I I go to if I'm on YouTube and I want to watch a clip from True Romance I'll just watch that through and then probably tweet about it <laughs> so <laughs> that's my what's yours it, yeah I like the roller what coaster scene I mentioned earlier the mm-hmm. roller coaster it's just it's just bizarre it should it, but I also believe it is like if I was gonna have a try and sell drugs to someone I'd probably try and go like crazy and do it on a roller coaster it just it, it just makes sense for these kind of unhinged characters to have this conversation on a bit of a roller coaster and as you said it just feels very very Tony Scott and kind of a bit wild I like it I love this film um and it's interesting that you know as we sort of said earlier it's a box office flop and it sort of then found an audience later on um and obviously the podcast is all about film restoration and obviously we're celebrating the new release from Arrow which I love the new release from Arrow um it looks fantastic the new 4k restoration but i just the artwork that they've commissioned for the box set is stunning as well yeah it's gorgeous it's gorgeous i mean i i, I did message you as soon as it was announced and i was like what <laughs> straight away the the biggest box the biggest box set they've got uh, i was i i was instant purchase didn't even need to consider it no but why do you think uh this film did find an audience later on i suppose it's continuing to do so like i i watched it for the first time i'm sure with the release of this box that others will watch it for the first time do you think it's because people kind of know more now about Tony Scott and Quentin Tarantino and they're like oh actually let's go back and watch this 90s film because I don't think it's like ahead of its time or anything like it as we said it does feel like a relic of the 90s so is it maybe a bit of nostalgia there too yeah I think I think it's actually a huge combination of factors to be honest like like back then it found its audience because it's 
it's violent and it's sweary and it's got dialogue that no one had ever really heard before because no one was writing like Tarantino really at that time um, and then later as decades passed um, maybe people became more familiar with Tony Scott or were fans of Tony Scott that wanted to discover his past works and I think most of all it's definitely Tarantino Tarantino's fame growing and people looking at his past catalogue of films and just being like okay I'll, I've never I've never heard of that I'll check that out and then the cycle of people like me sharing it with people incessantly begins um, and it just it just keeps going and going and going uh, yeah I can't it's just reasons like that it's 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 a perfect cult video movie like it's it is. it is what I think of when I think of a cult movie because uh, I can see why it didn't necessarily maybe have mass appeal when it first came out uh, and then as soon as it hit home video it's spread like like wildfire and then just continued continued to do so yeah it seems quite fitting to find for it to find success on home video considering i suppose tarantino used to work at a video rental store and he it is all this sort of it's a film made by a film fan with all these pop culture references like clarence works at a kind of comic book pop culture video mm-hmm. store um it's why i said like we did one on last action hero as well which obviously has this sort of video rental store and that like it seems like that these films are kind of built for the vhs market um it's not like a massive budget. Like I'd love to see it in a cinema, but I don't feel like I need to see it in a cinema. Like it works just as well on my TV screen. Like it just feels built for watching at yeah. home. <laughs> I've, well, I've never, I've never seen it in cinema. I've never had, uh, I've never been fortunate enough. It was showing at Prince Charles in London uh, a couple of months ago, but obviously I just couldn't make that journey. Um, but no, I don't think it does necessarily need the cinema. Uh, it's, it's a perfect movie to watch home that's how I've always watched it and I've never felt a yearning to be like oh I wish I could see this in the cinema obviously that would be lovely because seeing anything in the yeah. cinema is lovely but um, I think especially with a new restoration of it one obviously I can't wait to dive in and watch it because it's a movie I love mm. uh, but I hope that it encourages even more people at some point to, to watch the film Um because I know when it, it briefly arrived on Netflix last year, and that's when I I used my my powers of persuasion to get lots of people to watch it, um, and I, and now I'll have a a brand new glitzy box set that I'll yeah. be like, oh well, if you've never seen this, just I'll lend you it, I'll lend you it, you can watch it, and then you can go buy it yourself. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that you know, this podcast is all about the importance of these re-releases because like this one's quite special because it's obviously got a huge new restoration in 4k and they've commissioned all this gorgeous artwork and it comes with all sorts mm-hmm. of art cards and booklets and extra features like i really always pull out the stops for releases like this because i know that there's obviously an audience out there for true romance and it is a kind of audience who will collect these like special editions like like yeah. us too like <laughs> like yeah yeah like, like, like us I, I, I cannot resist it cannot resist it but i don't feel like i mean cheap cheap and out by it like it's not it doesn't feel like a cheap release and that was the first thing i thought when i saw the listing on on zavi as i thought oh they've really they've really put in the effort like they've got multiple different kinds of artwork mm. um a few different releases to choose from uh, which is always a good sign and and let's like, say in my experience arrow have never not pulled out the stops like i have the robocop release which is like one of my oh, favorite yeah. physical med- physical media purchases um in my collection and i have no doubt that true romance is going to earn that status and in, mm-hmm. in my special box of of a uh, collector's blu-ray oh your special box um We'll go into that later for my last question of the podcast. But mm-hmm. uh, why do you think it's important that we have uh, re-releases like this? As we sort of said earlier, it is about finding the audience. And I know you said obviously briefly around Netflix, but nothing lasts forever on a streaming service either. And the quality you get from these new releases is so important. So do you think that is it? It's that it's just the quality as well as the fact that it can find new audiences. Anything to reaffirm physical media as a means of watching movie, uh, movies and any entertainment is is really important to me personally because I love physical media. I love the stability of physical media, even watching stuff on streaming. Um, if you have any problems with your internet, it can affect the streaming quality of a film. We all have um, problems with internet. It's just, the internet is not, cannot whereas, be trusted. 
Exactly. Whereas if you are holding that Blu-ray in your hands and you put it into your respective player, whether it's a PlayStation, Xbox, or or a player itself, it is steady all the way. And then when you have a restoration like Arrow have done with uh, with True Romance, it's like it's it's even better because you're getting something that you can't really get anywhere yeah. else apart from with them, and it feels it feels like an occasion. Um, I appreciate. Not everyone invests in box sets anymore, but I, I really wish they would because they put they put in so much effort to these movies that people love. And True Romance is a film that maybe someone who doesn't invest in physical media anymore will say that they adore, and they should take the time to look at it. And if they if they they can uh, invest in it, because physical media, not that I think physical media is going to die out anytime soon. I'm not like a doomsday person in that sort of regard. Um, it is, it's regretfully nowhere near as popular as it once was and Arrow releases are doing a huge part to keep people coming back in with, with fancy um, <laughs> stunning artwork and bringing back classics importantly like diving in like really listening to what people want um, because True Romance is one that I, I've even tweeted about wanting an Arrow release like last year, and I know they've like they <laughs> listened they to delivered. people on Robocop, and they deliver yeah. and they cut they, and that's that's what I like. It uh, it feels like that now that uh, physical media companies are really listening to what people want that are buying physical media and they're producing the goods, and yeah, that's just something to be celebrated. I think. Yeah, I think you hit a nail on the head as well with it being an event. It's a landmark. It's not just like oh it's just let's just shove it out again on disc the amount of effort and love that they put like it's the love that they put into it you can tell that everyone who's con- contributed to this release like whether it's someone's written a new essay for the collector's edition or the people like as the people are who obviously listen to fans and then brought this release like it just feels like it's made with love and i think that's there's something quite special about it and it is an event like i can't wait to sort of read all the new essays and watch the behind the scenes features mm-hmm. maybe that's because i'm a bit nerdy but I always remember growing up. Watching. I love all that. We love all that stuff. That's what yeah. it's there for. Like it's it's there. It's a treasure trove of stuff to dive into beyond the movie, and that is another huge benefit of yeah. these physical media releases. They they are more than a movie. They are books almost, and almost in their side, little mini books. Uh, not endless, but a huge amount <laughs> of special features, deleted scenes, commentary. Uh, so and yeah, like I just can't imagine not being. Uh, not being buzzed about that for a movie that I love. Yeah, I remember growing up and being fascinated with behind the scenes. Like I think I must have watched my favorite films, The Dark Knight. And I must have watched a behind the scenes feature in a Dark Knight DVD of the truck flip and how Chris Cobble mm-hmm. did the truck flip. Probably more times than I might have even seen the film because to me it's like mm-hmm. the magic of movie making. And I don't think on some releases you get as those as good of behind the scenes features like I kind of miss it but obviously on a re-release like this like they really deliver and True Romance is an, it's an interesting story behind it as we said earlier how Tarantino sort of developed the script and then sold it to Tony Scott and the sort of evolution of how it came to the screen it's, a, it's an interesting sort of historical kind of artifact as well in a sense yeah, yeah it completely is it's not, it, I, th- I think it's uh a gift for a film like True Romance to have a story that it does because that if you tell someone about True Romance and you're trying to convince them to watch it those are the details you share with them you don't share in my in my experience I don't share what the story of True Romance is I tell them that it's a Tarantino script that was that was sold to Tony Scott with the Top Gun and then enlightened until that and then that always makes people go oh wow yeah let's watch this then that sounds <laughs> interesting and a physical media release is just that that's interesting feeling expanded um, hugely yeah yeah so we're on to my last question which is my favourite because it is all about how people organise their DVD shelves because I'm kind of low-key obsessed with it um, and it always comes up on Twitter like once a month and people argue and you've always said you got a special box for collector's editions so is that I how do. you do you separate by label or like do you have like DVDs and alphabetical order I obviously do mine in alphabetical order or I then have like a your collector's edition separate. Just, just, just explain the Okay, thinking. so right, right, right now I don't have. I, I would ideally have shelves to to put them all on. I do not have the space for that at the moment. So they are kept in boxes underneath my bed. But the boxes themselves, uh, I do have oh. one special box which is all the steelbooks, 
collector's editions, um, and 4K Ultra HD ones because they're they're more expensive than the rest. And um, <laughs> I'll keep them all in their box. They aren't alphabetized in there, but they are piled with steel books to the top, and the sturdier box yeah. is generally at the bottom because the steel can can get damaged, um, and the the overlays with the the information in the back can be easily ripped. Uh, and then the rest of my Blu-rays are alphabetized in in boxes uh, as much as as much as possible. I when I move to my new flat and uh, have the room hopefully to mm-hmm. alphabetize all of my collector's edition Blu-rays, that will be my dream come true. I want to get the magnetic knife strips and put my steel books oh, on yeah. on the wall. And uh, that that's my dream. We'll see how my girlfriend feels about that. But that's what I would like to do. <laughs> it, you gotta have like the best the best looking still books because some of the artwork and still books. I mean, we spoke about the artwork for True Romance. It just it's just it is a work of art. <laughs> it's, it's not. Yeah, I want I want I want those up and up up for people to see when they come in and they're like, oh, I'm gonna watch a movie. Yeah, look at what I have. <laughs> and then they can go and see they can go see all that these incredible looking Blu-rays that don't just look like bog like bog standard box standard uh, dvd casing uh, and artwork like true romance is something i if i was to i think if you give it to anyone they would actually have a good look at it and they would analyze it because like oh what's this 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 looks fancy and it's because it is yeah and um i hope i hope people get as much out of it or at least a portion of what i'm going to get out of it (laughs) i hope so too and i think also talking about the artwork it's what like it's what used to draw me in like back in the video rental stores like your blockbusters if you'd see stunning artwork in the film and that i'd be like oh i want to know more about that rather than just a standard poster and i think with true romance they've really like brought into that they're like look at this gorgeous artwork of alabama and christian slayton alabama we didn't even didn't, we didn't talk about alabama's wardrobe stunning wardrobe in true romance but the use of color for the wardrobe and stuff yes. is insane and it just pops out in the artwork you see the artwork and you're like i want to know more about that movie yeah, every, everyone's uh, outfits in it are very distinctive. Clarence's uh, Hawaiian shirt, I, I I really want, but I've not been able to find um, a, a decent replica anywhere of it. Um, but yeah, Alabama's outfit, the sunglasses, the 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 print like skirt she wears, yeah. I believe. Or um, yeah, uh, the the outfits in it just couple up with the whole distinct feeling of like the early 90s to me yeah yeah and it's something that the artwork i think uh really picks up on for this new release but it's just it's just yeah absolutely just... bursting with color bursting with color all over it the the this more standard blurry i believe it's is it the steelbook design um that just features clarence and alabama um feels very much like badlands which is like clearly a big compliment to yeah um, to to liken it to that, which it clearly is, it's it stems from that kind of world of movie of two two young lovers on the run, and it reminded me of that instantly. Whereas the more deluxe box set has has Clarence in Alabama, it has Vincent Cacotti, it has everyone in it, and it's yeah. got the it's like almost set against a a sunset, and it's just got this. It, even the cover looks dreamy. Um, yeah, it's that dreamy like glossy before, LA. And that's just, that's just perfect. Speaks to the movie. Yeah, yeah, they've really nailed it. And um, yeah, I love this film. I had such a good time. Um, obviously, it's just, it's just a good film. Yes. I, I'm so relieved <laughs> when you said you liked the movie. Um, I was, I was dreading talking to you about it in case, in case you hated it, because you would have been the first person I know to not enjoy. Maybe the first romance. person so in the world. That, that's the biggest selling point. Yeah, that's the biggest selling point we can probably say for this movie that anyone I know that's ever watched it has said, "Oh, that was a great movie." Um, so, so buy it. <laughs> go, go and watch this movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thanks for joining us to talk about True Romance. I'm sure obviously you had a good time. You'd love talking about True Romance, as we as we could just tell. Yes, yeah, so you don't even need to thank me. I will thank you for having me on to talk about it. <laughs> thank you, Cameron. And if people want to follow you on social media, see more of your work, uh, where can they do that? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and pretty much any other social media at FruFilm, F-R-E-W, film. Yeah, and that's where Cameron shares all of his film opinions. Mostly good. Some some I disagree with. 
I'm, 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 you know what? I'm always a positive guy. <laughs> you just may not agree with my positivity. And I, that I can handle. Yes, but Cameron shares all his uh, work on there, so go give him a follow. And once again, thank you for joining us. I had, I had a great time talking about True Romance. Thank you. And we'd love to hear our listeners' thoughts on both the film and the podcast, so please share them with us on our social media pages. Just use the hashtag Video Rewind. On Twitter, we are at Zavi. On Facebook, we are Zavi Online. And over on Instagram, you can find us at Zavi UK. We also upload our podcast to YouTube in video form. So you want to check that out. Our channel is at Zavi. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on a platform of your choice so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a rating or review too. And if there's a film you'd like us to discuss, just let us know on social media once again using the podcast hashtag Video Rewind. Thanks for listening. This was Zavi's Video Rewind and I'll see you in the next one. 